Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Just a short video today, as I was struck by something while watching a video starring our old friend Ray Comfort the other day. Now, this clip is a bit older, and it comes from an older episode of the 700 Club. You can tell it's older as Ray still has some of the color in his hair, even though notorious walking corpse Pat Robertson looks exactly the same as he does today. The embalming process that's been used on that man is top-notch, no doubt about it. If you're unfamiliar with Pat Robertson, here's a short clip of him attempting to convert a non-believer. I'm sorry, that that might have been the wrong clip. I'm not sure. But anyway, Pat and Ray are discussing a book that was written by Ray back in 2009 called You Can Lead an Atheist to Evidence, But You Can't Make Him Think. So let's hear what Ray and Pat had to say on the subject of atheism and, more specifically, evolution. Ray, welcome back. Thank you very much. Uh, Tell me about the essentials of Darwinism. What, what have you understood that Darwin taught? Well, the first essential thing about Darwinism, as it pertains to atheism, is that the two have nothing to do with one another. Atheism and Darwinism are two completely different things. There are atheists who accept evolution, yes, and there's also plenty of theists who accept evolution. According to Pew Research, 82% of the overall U.S. population believe in evolution, even if they may think that it was guided by a higher power. And even when looking specifically at those who are religiously affiliated, creationists are in the extreme minority, with Catholics only having 13% believing in creationism, and even those with the highest concentration of creationists, those who would be white evangelical Protestants, only having about 38% creationists in their midst, the other 62% subscribing to Darwinism or evolution. So Darwinism is not part and parcel with atheism, as most Christians accept evolution these days. And being atheist does not require one to accept evolution either, as even 11% of the unaffiliated which is where atheists would fall in the research, believe in some form of creationism. Now, that creationism need not be God-induced, so there are atheists who believe that humans were created by some other means. The point is that conflating Darwinism and atheism is to fundamentally misunderstand one or both of those things. All atheism is, is not believing in God. And all Darwinism, or evolution, is, is the acceptance of the proven processes of changes in allele frequencies over time and natural selection resulting in species differentiation over long periods of time. It's basically idolatry, creating God, and a God in your own image, a God that doesn't demand moral accountability, and that's why it's so embraced by this generation. They've given themselves to darkness, created a God in their own image, and they don't feel morally responsible to it. This gets back to the idea that atheists just want to sin and don't want to have to deal with accountability for their misdeeds. Which, of course, doesn't make any sense for a variety of reasons. For one, there is accountability for actions, absence of God, or being sent to hell. I mean, it's not as though atheists don't believe in the criminal justice system or getting arrested for committing crimes or accountability towards those whom you may have wronged in the past, such as being sued and then being forced to pay restitution to that wronged party. Not to mention cultural or community accountability by being ostracized, losing one's standing, or in other ways punished by family, friends, or community for misdeeds. There's accountability beyond the idea of getting thrown into hell for doing wrong. But what is also so backwards about this idea of getting rid of God in order to avoid accountability is that Christianity provides exactly that, a way to avoid accountability. 
Just admit what you did, say a couple of Our Fathers and a few Hail Marys, and you get your Get Out of Hell Free card. Christianity teaches total moral and spiritual absolution for even the most heinous of wrongdoings, and all it takes is saying sorry to the man upstairs. You don't even have to apologize to those that you've actually wronged, let alone make any attempt at restitution for what you've done. And of course, any confession to any member of the clergy is inadmissible as evidence, so you can even avoid any legal ramifications for your misdeeds. So, who is really pushing avoiding taking responsibility for what you've done wrong? Well, it has so many holes in it, but what are some of the significant uh, uh, flaws in the theories of evolution that he has advocated? Well, you just, you know, God gave us six senses. Mm -hmm. The sixth sense is common sense, and that's what the atheist and the evolutionists lack. You've just got to think for a moment. Let's pretend I'm a believer in evolution for a moment. There's a big bang, life form begins, and over millions of years, a dog evolves. Mm -hmm. It's the first dog. He's got a tail legs, teeth, eyes, and it's good that he's got eyes because he needs to look for a female. He's been blind for millions of years, but now he can see. Right. He's got to find a female. She's got to be evolved at the right place, the right time, with the right reproductive organs, and a desire to mate. Mm -hmm. Because without a female, he's a dead dog. <laughs> and this is where I truly ran into a problem with Ray and what he's saying. This bit left me utterly confused, and I had to actually re-watch it a few times. At first, I thought that Ray was trying to say that the first creature that could be called a dog was male, and it was the first dual sexually reproductive mammalian species, and that all the creatures that came before it on the evolutionary ladder were all asexual. So the first male creature, the dog, needed to find a female, and there wouldn't have been any around because it was the first ever male creature. And of course, this didn't make any sense to think this way, so I was very confused. But then I realized what Ray was actually positing. It isn't that Ray thinks evolution says dogs were the first gonochoric mammals. It's that Ray thinks evolution says dogs just crawled, fully formed, out of some protoplasmic goo. That the first dog was the only thing like it that had ever lived on the planet and that a female dog would have also had to have climbed out of the goo in order to breed. Or maybe he thinks that a virus belched out a dog one day, or something to that effect. The point is that Ray thinks that the dog was the first creature that was in any way like that. This is what Ray and people like him think evolution says, that there was no dog and nothing that was in any way like a dog, and then a dog just popped up one day and needed another dog to pop up spontaneously and be a different sex in order to breed with it. So I realized that I had been giving Ray too much credit in assuming that he had even the most rudimentary of understanding about evolution when he clearly doesn't. I was assuming that he at least understood that every animal comes from an evolutionary precursor, which is close enough to that animal as to be indistinguishable as a different species. And it's only when looking at two creatures over vastly different time periods do you really see the differences between them. I figured that Ray at least understood that the first dog, not that there would have been one individual who could have been said to be the actual first dog, that it was the product of its mother and father, who themselves would have been proto-dogs or canine creatures extremely dog-like. But that for some reason, Ray thought those proto-dogs were asexual, when in fact they too would have been gonochoric, as would their evolutionary precursors have been, and their precursors, and so on and so on. So early dogs would have been able to mate with proto-dogs, whose offspring would have been more dog-like themselves, until the dogs outnumbered the proto-dogs. As a matter of fact, recent molecular evidence shows that dogs are descended from the gray wolf, which is why modern dogs and modern wolves share an evolutionary link. So I was just giving Ray too much credit. I was assuming his intelligence and understanding of evolution was about up here, when in fact it was really more down here. 
I liken it to trying to explain math to someone who doesn't understand the simplest of calculations and with only a faint grasp of numbers in general. What, you mean 2 plus 2 equals 4? What kind of sense does that make? 4 is a completely different number than 2. How do you have a 2 and then another 2 and think that gets you to a totally different number like 4? Obviously, when you add 2 and 2, you get 22. And that's just common sense. See, because Ray doesn't understand evolution himself, he thinks that the problem is that evolution is not understandable at all. That it makes no sense at all, not just that it doesn't make sense to him. So, when you have ignorance plus low ability to grasp scientific concepts, added with relatively high ego and a hefty heaping of the Dunning-Kruger effect, this all results in a mindset that leads one to believe that the theory must be flawed rather than their own perception of it or ability to understand it. And since he's convinced through all of this that the theory itself must be flawed, he comes to the inescapable conclusion that anyone who advocates for it must be too foolish to see its flaws the way he does. So it's the person who insists that 2 plus 2 equals 22, chastising the 2 plus 2 equal 4 proponents for being foolish. It gets to the point where you almost feel sorry for them. Or at least, I might feel sorry for them if this weren't Ray Comfort we were talking about. <laughs> there's, no, there's no species. You've got yeah. to have a female. Yeah. And you've got to relate this to not only dogs, but giraffes, elephants, horses, cats, cows, mice. Mm. Uh, birds, fish, everything has to have a female evolve at the right place, at the right time, right reproductive organs, and a desire to mate. And, just like the dog, all of those animals would have evolved from evolutionary precursors who were almost identical to them and were themselves dual-sex species and close enough genetically that they could interbreed, with the offspring tending towards the traits of the quote-unquote more evolved parent. I mean, even we Homo sapiens interbred with our Neanderthal cousins. Ray then goes on to attack secular attempts to enforce the separation of church and state, which is foolish for its own set of reasons, but it was this bit of his critical misunderstanding of evolution, while believing himself well-versed on the subject, that I wanted to comment on today. Not to mention the spit-take-inducing irony of someone with such stunted critical thinking skills hawking a book called You Can Lead an Atheist to Evidence, But You Can't Make Him Think. So keep this in mind when you find yourself confronted by creationist arguments and perspectives that are difficult to follow in their logic. You may be assuming that they have some base-level understanding of the topic that they're simply misapplying or misunderstanding when in fact, they may have no comprehension of it at all. So thanks for watching everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you wanna go.